Today is Friday, December 25th, 2020, and the final day of Fiendmas. Hello, Fiendlings. How the hell are you? And uh, happy holidays. Have you enjoyed your Fiendmas gifts? I hope so, because just like life, there are no refunds. Before we get to the last episode of Fiendmas, I want to give you all a big thanks, especially to those of you that are fans of the Derelict Saga and Patreon patrons. Despite all the delays due to personal, professional, and health problems, the ending of my relationship with my publisher and life in general, you're still here, still sending me emails and still enjoying the universes I create. I hope you'll stick around once Derelict is done because there's so much more coming. To that end, if you want to help support the podcast, The Derelict Saga, not to mention production of The Black Extinction, and you have a little change in your pocket, consider heading over to shadowpublications.com, punching that buy me a coffee link, and send me some love. Or join my Patreon at patreon.com slash Paul E. Cooley and pledge a monthly sum to get access to exclusive content, such as early podcast episodes and even the final audiobook versions of all shadowpublications.com productions. If you're an Audible subscriber, spend a credit on one of my books. Kindle Unlimited? Give my other works some page read love. If you don't have a little change, no worries. Just keep listening and spread the word. This is my 13th year of podcasting. Been a long, strange trip, as they say, and all of you that tune in week to week make it worth continuing. So thank you for letting me into your ear holes and mind, and for letting me know someone is listening. Be safe, have a great week, happy holidays, and we'll talk again soon. Here's episode four of Derelict Trident. Chapter five. It didn't matter how much body armor the suit provided, nor the damage his flechette rifle could inflict. It didn't even matter that one quarter meter of Atmos steel separated him from the cargo bay. Dickerson was terrified. Staring at the creature floating in the cargo bay through the cams was enough to make his brain jitter. He'd hoped he'd never see the things again, not even on hollow, as unlikely as that seemed. But even in his worst moments, he hadn't considered they'd ever get aboard the ship. Yet here one was. How the fuck did it get here? Dickerson asked. Does it matter? Carb asked. Stop the chatter, Callie Murray said. Dickerson moved a few steps back from the cargo bay hatch until he was parallel with his squad mates. He'd already closed the adjoining hatches, leaving them in a small area that served as an airlock. Went, Copenhaver, and Murdoch, the other squad, waited in one of the corridors. They were the backup plan in case something went drastically wrong. Like anything could possibly go wrong, he thought. We only have an exosolar life form in the cargo bay. Surely that's not a problem. Squad, ready? Kelly Moore asked. To shepherd a fucking alien? Sure, boss. Carb said. Carb? Kelly Moore said. Cut the shit. Others are listening. There was a slight pause before Carb replied. Affirmative, boss. Ready, Dickerson lied. He wouldn't be ready for this if they had ten marines going in there. Lieutenant, we're going in. Copy, Corporal. Calby said. Proceed. Proceed. That was a ridiculously flippant thing to say. No, Dickerson corrected himself. The tone in Talby's voice had been anything but flippant. Copy, Lieutenant. Kelly Morris said. Squad, let's get that hatch open. Dickerson kept the cam feet on his HUD and found himself barely able to look away from it. The pine cone floated near the SV-52, far away from the entrance to the cargo bay, but that was little comfort. They had to go inside and corral it. Black, hit the lights, Kelly Morris said in a long exhale. I don't like this plan, Dickerson said, his mic muted. Any plan that called for them to be locked in the void-damned cargo bay with a pine cone was insane, wasn't it? The lights in the cargo bay disappeared, and the lights inside the airlock dimmed to a deep twilight. His skin itched and crawled with imaginary arachnids, legs ending in talons, and... Open it up, Carb, Kelly Morris said. Carb reached forward and activated the hatch. Dickerson switched his cam feeds to infragreen and breathed a little easier. Now he could at least see the inside of the cargo bay instead of having to try not to forget the location of a crease in decking, a toolbox, or a mooring line. But the creature didn't show up. One foot at a time, he told himself, and Crouch walked inside, 
His rifle pointed in the direction of where the creature had been. Lance Corporal Dickerson, Black said. I'm updating your HUD with the creature's location. Her voice had made him jump, but he recovered quickly. Before he could speak, a black shape rendered across the world of green. How are you doing that? he asked. I pumped CO2 in from the baffles, Black said. I am monitoring absorption rates. Keep moving, Kelly Morris said. A distance gauge appeared below the shape. The centimeters ticked off steadily as he continued crouch walking. Seven meters. Six. The pine cone thing had turned toward him, its shape completely devoid of features or details. Dickerson's breath hitched in his throat when he noticed the shape was fading into green. Black, it's disappearing. Not enough CO2 remaining, Black said. Kelly Mori hissed into the comms. Hold position. Boss, Carb said. It's not like it can hear us. The corporal started to respond, her breath hitting the mic, but no words came out. Dickerson grinned, despite the fear threatening to lock him in place. Kelly Mora had finally realized she was whispering. Black, Kelly Mora said. What do we do here? Stand by, Black said. The seconds passed with excruciating slowness, his mind conjuring the shape on the green HUD as if it were no more than a half meter away. His trigger finger twitched, straining to pull back and loose a flechette round into the darkness. An icon flashed on his HUD, causing him to scrunch his eyebrows together. The words, .8G, detected. Gravity. Turn on your lights, Black said. Are you insane? Dickerson asked. Or did you figure that it was a good time to make jokes? Yeah, Black, Carb said. Those things love light. They do, Black agreed. So what's to keep it from attacking us? Dickerson asked. Gravity, Black said. Turn your suit lights to one quarter power. Kelly Mora was the first to bring up her suit lights. She stood a few meters behind Dickerson, his shadow stretching before him in the glare. He felt as though his heart had stopped. The pine cone was a mere three meters from him, its silver talon glinting in the light. He brought his own suit lights up and focused them not on the creature itself, but the area around it. The pine cone thing appeared to track his every movement, but remained motionless. Black. Why isn't it moving? Kelly Morris said. I have restored gravity to the cargo bay with the exception of a path leading to the original quarantine area. Wait, Dickerson said. It can't move in normal gravity? No, Black said. It attempted to move into the gravity field, but immediately began to descend. In addition, the creature jerked backward as if in surprise or as a defensive mechanism. Regardless, Black said. The creature cannot attack you. Dickerson brought his lights to bear on the pine cone, and its carapace danced as if with heat haze. So, uh, how do we drive it? A light appeared at the far end of the cargo bay. The 3D printers had come online, and although he couldn't hear them, he could tell they were about to manufacture something. Dickerson studied the printers for a moment before refocusing his attention on the strange creature. I am printing an outmost steel shell we can use to partition the creature. Black said. As she spoke, the creature dipped slightly in the air. Its talon flicked in and out of its sheath as if in anger, surprise, or maybe even fear. The pinecone thing quickly drifted away from him, moving further into the cargo bay and toward the quarantine area. As it fled, it gained height. Modulating the gravity? Dickerson asked. Yes, Black said. The creature continued moving backward before dipping again. The pine cone, hopefully reacting to instinct rather than sentience, did more than drift backward this time. Using some form of propulsion Dickerson still didn't understand, the creature flipped horizontally and flew at nearly two meters per second toward the quarantine area. Carb? Kelly Morris said. Get the patch. Dickerson, you'll weld. Ah, Corporal, Dickerson said. While Carb approached the printers to retrieve the several centimeter thick makeshift barrier, Dickerson walked to the tool area and grabbed one of the handheld welding torches. His fingers slipped the first time because his eyes kept flipping back to the cam feed with the creature. He didn't care what Black thought or what the AI said. He wasn't turning his back on the creature. He'd much rather run into something he could have avoided than allow that thing to attack him. If Black's gravity ploy didn't work, he'd destroy the cursed thing with a blast from his flechette rifle. Torch in hand, he cautiously turned around and faced the quarantine area Black had created. 
Overhead lights came to life and illuminated the quarantine area. The creature sensed the bright light and immediately headed for the light source. Dickerson exhaled a breath he hadn't known he'd been holding. With the rest of the grav plates off, except for those containing the creature, Carb easily carried the heavy sheet of Atmos steel to within two meters of the ancient stasis pod. Dickerson, you coming? Carb asked. She was trying to sound icy, but failing. The fact she was uneasy about this little operation made him feel a little better. He wondered how the corporal was coping. Rather than respond, he magwalked to stand beside her. Okay, I'm here. Put that thing in position. Why is it I always end up doing the heavy lifting? Carb said. You may be Lug Elliot all over Mira, and now I'm just a deck monkey? Cut the chatter, Callie Morris said. Get it into position and weld it shut. If it makes any sudden movements, clear the area and I'll blast it. Ah, Corporal, Dickerson said. Blast it. Right. Never mind the flechettes that would go bouncing around the cargo bay. Never mind how much debris the creature would turn into as it contaminated the area. They wouldn't be able to walk in here without a suit. Maybe never again. Who the void knew what kind of bacteria or viruses these things carried? What if their carapaces produced some sort of virulent compound that would eat their flesh and dissolve them where they stood? What if- Dickerson! Carb yelled. He snapped out of his reverie and realized Carb had the metal sheet in position. The creature had retreated to the back of the quarantine area as Black continued adjusting the light to attract it. Dickerson shuffled himself until he stood beside Carb and began welding at waist height. The bonding agent quickly melted the metal together with little more than a glow at its tip. When he finished the first weld, he shuffled past Carb and did the same on the other side. He handed the torch to her and held the sheet in place. She ducked down and began the lower welds to fasten. Thank the void you're so short, Dickerson said. Fuck off, Carb said. Besides, I thought you liked spinning me like a top in conjugal. Dickerson blushed bright red beneath his visor, and an unexpected grin lit his face, although no one could see it. He half expected Callie Mora to yell at Carb again, but realized his squadmate had made the comment over a private channel. At least she was learning. The entire command crew was probably listening to every word they said and watching every move they made. He couldn't blame them. Finding a hostile stowaway on board was more than anyone should wake up to. When said unwelcome guest was an exosolar life form? Yeah, that was about the worst way to wake up he could imagine. No, it's not, he told himself. Waking up to find you have no atmosphere, leaving you choking in the dark would be the worst. And every step aboard Mira had felt that way. Carb finished the lower welds, adjusted her mag boots, and floated to the top of the cargo bay. While she finished putting the last welds in place, Dickerson connected the black via block. Yes, Lance Corporal Dickerson. It was in the stasis pod. Yes, the AI said. I was unaware of its existence until it broke out of the stasis pod. How the void did it do that? Dickerson asked. Done! Carb yelled over the squad channel. He could almost hear Kelly Morris sigh in relief. Okay, squad, she said. Stand by. What's she doing? Carb asked over a private channel. Probably talking to the captain and the LT, Dickerson said. Maybe Black is running some pressure checks, too. I don't like the fact that thing is on the ship, Carb said. Me neither. So why didn't Black just flush it out of the airlock? Dickerson hissed a sigh. You really want to put another of those things out there in space when we don't know how it reproduces or what the fuck it's doing? Point, Carb said after a moment. We're going to be busy in here. What's to keep it from making another appearance? The big marine laughed. If it can chew through a fresh Atmos steel plate, we have other problems. Carb didn't respond, and he suddenly knew why. The idea of that thing somehow clawing its way through the thick metal to surprise them was terrifying. One minute you're loading ammo into the support vehicle, and the next you're fighting for your life. Good job, squad, Kelly Morris said. Black has it in a complete blackout and at half gravity. It's not going anywhere. Dickerson smiled in spite of himself. Good to hear, he said. Now what? Now, Kelly Morris said, we load up and go get red.